<laughs> Tales of Arise? No, no, no. <laughs> More like... Probably the best RPG I've played all year, at least in terms of games that released in 2021. But it's kind of hard saying that was the best game I've played this year because I played so many of them, but it was definitely up there, I gotta say. I really enjoyed pretty much every aspect of the game as a whole. Tales of is a series that apparently gets a lot of hate. I mean, I've never played a game I didn't like. Even Cars for the Game Boy Advance. If there's one thing that frustrated me about the Tales of series during the 2010s was that the games were running on an old engine and they all looked like PS3 games and played like PS3 games and, and smelled like PS3 games. It was clear that the series was being held back by its annual launch schedule, something which is always a bad thing with video games. The quality was also wildly inconsistent. This is a hot take, but I really enjoyed Tales of Zestiria. I mean, admittedly it was my first game, and looking back it was very rough, but Berseria wasn't much better. They were fun games, don't get me wrong, but they did so little to distinguish themselves from previous games in the series that at that point in 2014 and 2016 they just felt stale. And that is the precise reason why Tales of Arise is so freaking good. From a mechanical and structural standpoint, Arise isn't all that vast of a departure from the previous entries. In fact, in a lot of cases, it ditches things in favor for simplicity. A perfect example of this is found in the combat system. Tales had been using the same combat system with minor revisions for like five or six games, and Tales of Zestiria was when it really began to crumble under the weight of bloated subsystems and insane technical crap that can contributed almost nothing to the game overall. Berseria tried to overhaul the system to allow for more player input on how the characters controlled, but in my opinion, it just didn't feel good. Then we have Arise strutting in from the corner of the room and simply just doing something completely different. It strips back the layers of fat and delivers on a fully refined, super fun and flashy combat system. It combines the joyful simplicity of the PS2 era titles and the superior flow of the recent entries. Arise instantly feels better than any other Tales of game I've played to date. Once again, from a story and character standpoint, this game doesn't really do anything that hasn't been done by Tales in the past. We got a stoic, headstrong protagonist, a mysterious mysterious girl, a really hot guy, racial oppression, and rising up against it. Wait, this is just Tales of Symphonia. One of the things that I like most about this game, though, is that the core cast of characters are just normal people. There's no weird, edgy wild card to throw the dynamic out of whack just for the sake of forced conflict. To put it simply, the characters and story are entertaining, and that's something that resonates throughout every aspect of this game. Now we all have our own mental list of favorite games, and even then, there are sections of our most beloved titles that we dread when going back to them. For a lot of people, it's the Water Temple in Ocarina of Time, Atlantica in Kingdom Hearts 1, the Sandbird level in Super Mario Sunshine. A personal choice for me would be the Phantom Soldier boss fight in Star Ocean The Last Hope. For those who played, you know. Throughout my 60-hour playthrough, there was precisely one moment when the game started to become a bit too much, and it's a sentiment I've seen a lot of people sympathize with. Lord Ganabelt. He's one of the early game bosses, and the only fight in the game with a DPS check. So for those of you out there who aren't up to date on your MMO terminology, a DPS check is something a boss will do on occasion where if you don't deal enough damage in the time given, he'll wipe you flat on your face. This shit can become really aggravating, and in Lord Ganabelt's case, it comes early on before my party could consistently deal out big numbers of damage. So I get to the tail end of the fight and suddenly get my shit kicked in by this grade A bullshit. Aside from that though, I like how the majority of the bosses are just you versus the big bad boy himself, and rarely anyone else to back them up. It makes them feel strong, independent. All in all, I absolutely love the gameplay here. I hope that the series keeps this non-yearly release schedule so every game can play as smooth is this one. Did I also mention how this game is stupidly gorgeous to look at? This is one of the prettiest games I've ever played. This massive boost to production quality takes all of the aforementioned strengths and bolsters them tenfold. It's truly breathtaking the whole way through. Alright, uh, so with that out of the way, I'm getting into spoilers now. Time to complain. The game hasn't been out for long enough for me to tell whether or not this is going to turn into a hot take, but this game's story nosedives in the second act. Tales of Arise is comparable to Star Ocean Till the End of Time, which I talked about in my last video. In that game, the whole second act of the story recontextualizes everything in the first half. It goes from a pretty standard fantasy RPG to some pretty high concept stuff in only a couple of hours. The crucial difference between these two games is that in Star Ocean, the second act serves to raise the stakes way higher than the first act ever could have imagined. From that big turning point on, 
the pace is faster, the story packs a ton of punch into every cutscene, and the gameplay gets hard. In Tales of Arise, the second arc of the plot serves to answer the questions we had in the first half, while introducing the real threat and the current state of the planet Rena. Considering that most Tales of games play their stories really safe for one reason or another, I kind of appreciated the fact that the back half of this game was super weird, it was a breath of fresh air, some might say. The problem here is that the pacing seems to get slower the further you go in, and I feel the questions raised in the second half rarely get satisfying answers. Why did no Renan ever question why nobody had ever been to their home planet? That doesn't make any sense. This whole plot about the red mysterious women is super poorly implemented. They show up and are spoken of as if we had seen them before, but if we did, I don't remember. I was really hoping that the game would provide a second field to explore, whether that be Rena or Lenigus. After all, you've explored almost the entirety of Dana by the second act, so it's only common logic to assume that Rena will come next. It's the other planet, after all. Well, due to the story, that can't really happen, and Lenigus doesn't amount to much either. It's kind of just a walking simulator for the first half and a single, admittedly pretty good dungeon to top it off. We barely get to see any of Rena as well, the final dungeon is entirely underground, and his really poorly designed. When compared to Act 1, Act 2 heavily relies on his story, and that's what ends up falling apart the most. What kept it afloat for me though was the character interactions. I really do love the cast of this game. They mix so well together. Alfin and Shion's relationship was so cute throughout this chunk of the story. The pacing ends up taking a hit as well though, with multiple long story segments that completely fail to coexist with the combat. By that, I mean it's, well, boring. This game definitely rushes to its conclusion, and ends up leaving Voron underutilized and underdeveloped, which sucks, because it could have gone a couple hours longer to flesh him out, but it just doesn't. So yeah, the game doesn't exactly stick its landing. Surprisingly enough, though, the ending is actually really satisfying. Even through its issues, this game held my attention from start to finish, which nowadays is really rare. Very rarely does a game balance itself well enough that it feels like an unarguable step forward while still staying true to its roots. It excels at everything Tales of is known for as a JRPG comfort food franchise while modernizing it and providing a healthy dose of mass appeal. It takes what Tales of does well and simply just does it better, with little to no trade-offs. The game does have its weak points, but the rest of the adventure is so consistently well-crafted that it's absolutely worth every minute. And there's quite a bit of post-game content to play through as well. Maybe I'll get to it soon. Probably not. In fact, this game is so good that I barely even noticed the constant level of detail changes and the objects popping in all the time. Bandai, what the hell happened here? In short, forget all the bad stuff I just said and play the game. It's fun as hell. Tales of is back after a five year break and is stronger than ever. This game sold like crazy. And it won best RPG of the year at the Game Awards? Okay, okay, forget everything else. This is absolutely the best timeline. So you should subscribe.